All right, thank you everybody for being here. And we are gonna open up with Dylan Davis, Delaware Gazette. Ryan, just to get this out of the way, I'm just curious about the timeline with Tony when you were made aware of that decision, how that came about. Uh, yeah, I was made aware uh, last week, and um, and so now we're into the process of you know identifying replacements. Um, excited about the group that you know we've already identified, and um, you know I'm going to be thorough in the process. I think the good news is, you know, we're not in a situation where we have to make a quick decision based on you know uh, recruiting or the portal or anything like that. So, um, you know, I talked to the the uh, running backs. You know, they're great. Um, they're they're actually going to be you know part of the process. I'd like for um, the part of the interview process for the running backs to to meet the candidates. Um, you know, obviously, ultimately, I'll make the decision, and Chip will be a huge part of it. But but the input of the uh, the running backs will be important as well. But but they've been great, and uh, it was actually fun today. I, I took the running backs and um, you know coached them out there today, so that was fun, um, and we had a really good practice. Was that something that sprung upon you, or was that something that you kind of had an idea that maybe it was coming down the line? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't uh, know for sure until I was actually told, but, um, but yeah, but now, now the focus is, is about, you know, trying to find the right person. Um, you know, I think it's the best, um, running back room in the country right now. And so I think it's an exciting job and the candidate pool has been excellent. Uh, Jeremy Birmingham, the podcast. Ryan, as you get into this week of practice, how do you break up the quarterbacks differently? I mean, now the pads are on now that there's maybe a little bit more to learn this week. How do you uh, separate those guys? And, and is there a plan for that that you can let us in? Yeah, we, we, we rolled them again today. Uh, we were on and off the field in, in less than an hour and a half um, because it's our first practice back coming off of spring break, first day in pads. So a lot of a lot of things here that led us to believe the best thing to do is to kind of be on and off in an hour and a half. The next two practices will be, will be longer and more physical. Um, and so, you know, Chip and I are going to get together on that, figure out how we, we break down those reps, but there'll be a lot more reps the next couple of practices. Um, you know, we're still only three practices in, so we just want to roll them as much as we can, get as many reps as we possibly can. But like you said, as we start getting into the, the heart of practice, we'll start to divvy up those reps the best we can. Uh, Bill Landis, Kings of the North, and the podcast. Right. Uh, just trying to get, you know, like, I guess, lay the land on the offensive line. Um, Especially on the right side, like how how fluid are things there with Fryer and Montgomery and Tegra and Zell, like all those guys? Are you kind of letting them all play and see what shakes out, or, or how like a yeah? Today was the first day in pads, so uh, it's hard to evaluate anything until you get the pads on. And you know we're going to evaluate that right side really hard, really close, like you're saying. Um, I can't say we're in a different place now than we were about a month ago because there really isn't enough evaluation to go off of. Um, but we are trying to figure out what that is. Now I, I will say Josh Fryer. Uh, had one of the best off seasons of anybody in the in the building. Now we had some bunch of guys who had really good off seasons, but he he stuck out. So if he can continue to to you know stay in the the, the shape that he's in right now, um, I think he's going to have a really good spring and take that next step. If that's the case, uh, then the big spot will be at right guard, and you know Luke's in there now. But we got a bunch of guys you know moving through there. Uh, but if if Josh can you know possibly move into guard and then Tegra moves in, if Tegra makes a push, then then that'd be great as well. So, like you said, we have a few guys in there. You know, Austin's, you know, moving at, at, right now. He's at left guard. We could move him over to right if we needed to. So, it, it's a very tight competition in there. Um, you know, I'm hoping that we have, you know, some clarity as we, you know, get towards the end of spring. Um, and and then it continues into the preseason. But um, I guess the good news is we do have some guys with experience along the line, you know, between Donnie and Josh and Josh. They both have played a bunch, and Carson's played, and so has Seth. So, um, you know, hopefully in the next week or so, we got a little bit more to go off of. With, with Josh Fryer, Integra, and Luke Montgomery, and you kind of just touched on it there, do you view all three of those guys as guys you can play either guard or tackle as you try to figure out how that will shake out? I think so. I, I think that um, Tegra is probably more of a tackle uh, than he is a guard. He has played some guards, so he could do that. Um, uh, but both uh, Josh and Luke have both played guard and tackle. So we're going to try to figure out who the best five are. We've always done that. Um, and figure, you know, who who plays the tackle best, who plays the guard best, and go from there. Uh, Dave Biddle, 24-7 Sports. Ryan, Chip hasn't been here long and only two practices while Tony was still here, but I'm sure there was plenty of meetings and stuff like that. What's your level of concern now that some of the stuff that Chip's implemented, it, granted it's early, will now be shared with your rivals? Yeah, we, um, you know, we're nowhere near where we're going to be as we head down the road. Uh, this is, you know, that was – 
two practices in, in the spring. And, um, you know, a lot of what we did was, um, you know, what we've done in the past. And then we sprinkled in a couple of things that Chip's done, but, uh, there's just so much more that he has that's, uh, out in front of us. But I think more importantly, like this, this could look differently, uh, moving forward in terms of our offense, just, you know, how we're doing things, who's in what spots, you know, the, you know, we have really good receivers. We have really good tight ends. We have good running backs, but ultimately it comes down to what the quarterback can do well, the types of throws that he can make. Um, you know, the run game will look different. It just will. And that's a long time and a long journey to get to next November. So, um, you know, I, I just think there's going to be so many twists and turns along the way that I think, you know, and now with the quarterback communication, uh, being able to use that, which we've utilized the first three practices, that's been good. That certainly allows us, um, you know, more flexibility as we call plays. At linebacker, it seems like Cody Simon from talking to James Laurinaitis and Coach Noel seems like uh, Cody's locked in. What about the other linebacker spot? Sonny, CJ Hicks, Gabe Powers. What do you feel about? How do you feel about those guys? Uh, very competitive in, in each team drill. You see us um, for the first, you know, we call them racks uh, in 11 personnel. And so then we'll see, we'll, you'll see nickel in the game there. Um, you're seeing you know, a lot of guys rotate in and out around there. But then when, when you put 12 in the game, um, and we get into base personnel on defense. Now you're seeing, you know, Sonny do a little bit of the that Sam linebacker. So he has some flexibility there. And again, this is another one. You know, I don't have a ton of updates because we just today was the first quick day in pads. But but you are seeing those guys learn those positions, and then hopefully in the next week or so, you're seeing progress in certain areas. And then you know, Jim and the defensive staff will sit down and say, okay, here's we need to invest our time moving forward. And these are big decisions in the off season. You know, the the season's a long way away. And it's a long way away to get to where we need to be. But the decisions that are made over the next month or so are going to be critical in terms of the development of our team. Tony Urban, Buckeye Right back to the, the helmet communication stuff. Can you just explain how you are doing that, how it's working, and, and who's talking into who's, who's here, basically? Yeah, so they're allowing us um, three um, you know, devices in the helmets per practice, um, which is a little bit difficult because we have more than three quarterbacks. And then we also have the defensive side of the ball. So um, I wish there was more available, but there isn't. So um, right now we're working with three. And, um, you know, right now we've worked with the offensive side. There are going to be practices where we, we, you know, give the three devices to the defensive side so that Jim can work with that. But, um, you know, it's it's been good to kind of work through that. Chip well dealt with it when he was in the NFL. And so he has experience in that. Um, the easy thing is when you're in a huddle, you just call the play, the quarterback calls the play, and that's simple. But there are other ways to to build in different kind of hybrids between signals and calling it into the quarterback. Um, there's verbal, and then there's then there's the physical signals. So uh, we'll use you know a bunch of different ways to do it. We'll use wristbands, we'll use signals, uh, we'll huddle, we'll try to find as many ways to be uh, be creative in that area. And it's something new in college. So each day we're learning a little bit more about it. Uh, we're getting feedback from the quarterbacks and from the players. Like today, it would be what just the three quarterbacks would have it, and then you got it. Maybe Thursday, Cody and Gabe, and you got it right. That's yeah. that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So that um, the tricky thing we learned early on was uh, we had two huddles going on early. On. I think you guys were practicing one day. We were doing formations, and so Chip was calling it in to to the guys in the one huddle, and poor Lincoln, he's got it in his head, and I'm calling him the plays, and there was a voice in his head. He thought he was going crazy for a second. So. <laughs> He said, Coach, I got to take this helmet off. So we learned that we we can only have one quarterback getting a call at once. Um, but, uh, but no, I think the good thing about it is the quarterbacks are hearing the call. You know, so if, let's say, Will's up there and or Devin's up there, Lincoln's getting the call in his head, he's also seeing the signal. Uh, Stephen Means, Cleveland.com. A little bit more on the quarterback. Just for, uh, who's running the room right now as you're trying to do it? Okay, who are you going to find that run the room permanently? Running backs? Yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever worked with a running back room before? No. What's that experience been like? It's been awesome. <laughs> it's been great. It's been great. Yeah, I think you know I, we went in there and um, put up the first play, and the first play, I, I I think I went off for twenty minutes on one play. I think the, <laughs> some of the guys are looking around like, oh boy, um, but it was great. I, I think it's going to be good for them to see it through the eyes of a quarterback. I think it's really good for them in the passing game. I think it's really good for them overall to understand from a from a you know a high view on things. So we've had great meetings. We have a very intelligent group in that room. Uh, they're really good. They're diligent about taking notes. Um, again, I think it's the best running back room in the country. So uh, whoever we hire is going to have an unbelievable opportunity and a great group of guys. And obviously, Tony was probably one of the more valuable recruiters for you, especially the way he recruited. How much is that a, a 
part of the process of finding someone who can replace that element that you brought to the table. Yeah, I think when you're uh, you're bringing anybody into the program, you're trying to figure out, you know, what is their expertise? Um, you know, I, I shared this with the team. I think it's important. You know, we want to be the best team we can possibly be next year. Um, we have a bunch of talent, but it's not about individuals. It's about the team. You need each other in order to, to reach a goal. That's what's special about football. So, you know, the running back coach has to be an expert at coaching the running backs. You, know, you have to bring value every day. When you stand in front of a group of men, especially a group like we have in that room, you know, you have to, your competency has to be at a high level. You know, when you, when you stand in front of anybody in this building, you got to know what you're talking about. And it's about building trust. And you do that through competency, through connection with somebody, and then your character and who you are as a person. And so when you have trust, you can, you can really, um, you know, develop guys at a high level. Now, the recruiting part is very, very important, uh, and that's about building relationship and building trust through the recruiting process. Um, would we like somebody that has recruited at a high level already here? Yeah, I think that would be ideal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that's going to make the best player or, uh, excuse me, the best coach for that position. You know, I think about myself coming in here. I had never recruited at a place like Ohio State before. Um, but you know, it worked out for me. I think some other guys have been in that same situation before, you know, Brian Hartline had never recruited at this level before he played at this level, but he didn't recruit here. And so, um, while it's good to have the experience, we want to make sure we get the right guy and we're being very, very thorough in the interview process. Uh, we're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to take as much time as we need and make sure we get the right guy. On the heels of Jake Diebler becoming a head coach for the first time, you did it five years ago here. Very few people have that opportunity. What is it like, especially doing it in a place like Ohio State for the first time? Yeah, I, you know, congratulations to Josh and his family. Um, you know, so I was able to go over to the press conference and I uh, thought he did a great job this, you know, stepping in the tough spot this year and, um, you know, excited to see what that looks like moving forward. But I think, what you have to do is you just have to trust, you know, who you are. You have to learn from your experiences. Um, and, you know, you aren't starting from scratch. I think that's the thing as I look back on, you know, that experience for me, you know, there was guys on staff that were already here. Um, but then there were other things you had to change. There was already players there in place that you had to continue uh, what was working, but you had to identify the things you had to improve on. And so enhancing the things that are going well, but fixing the things you need to fix are important. And I think every year I learn more and more about, you know, what are the right things that need to get fixed and what are the right things that need to be enhanced. Um, not everything needs to be changed, but certain things do. And then having the courage to make those changes year in and year out and follow through and be strong um, is, is important. But ultimately it comes down to relationships again and building relationships with your staff, giving them great direction as a leader. You know, you're not an assistant coach anymore. You're the head coach. So your role has changed. And it's important to make sure you're communicating at a high level, giving direction to everybody, and then making sure everybody's accountable to do their job at a high level. Uh, Austin Ward, uh, the podcast. Right. This was another offseason where you seemed intent on taking a step back to, from a position to be the CEO, and then two practices later, you're jumping in with the running backs. Can, can you just not quit? Or like, what? I, I, I thought it was. it's just a great opportunity to spend some time with those guys. Um, and so I'm going to do that this week. And, um, you know, we, we have a bunch of guys who can help. And actually, uh, being at nine, we're able to, you know, move somebody in. We'll have Rob help out a little bit, Tony Johnson help out a little bit. So that, that's good. But um, but I think any time I can do that where I, you know, spend a little time, even just a week with those guys, I think it's great. I'm still able to stay in special teams. Um, you know, I jumped into, you know, some of the D-line meetings last week. I'll do the same thing in another week, jump into some other meetings. Uh, but the more I can sit in on those types of meetings, the better. Uh, in our off our off day, we switch between offense and defense. So while, while the offense is lifting, the defense will be meeting, and then vice versa. So that allows me to go over and, and be a part of that. Um, so it's fun. Um, I like to do you know be a part of you know the different position groups um, because I think again that builds trust. You know you're you're getting in front of those guys, and and I think that that builds a stronger connection with them. Um, and so you know I kind of jumped at the opportunity. I, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't want to speak for you. Maybe the COVID year was so unique, but every off season has thrown weird challenges, curveballs at you. Does this one seem more chaotic than others you've been through? I, I don't know if you could rank them or not, but right. it feels like this is this is carried all all the way over into March with things for you to deal with. Yeah, I, I don't. 
I don't look at it that way. I think um, early on, I, I think I, I said this to Jerry because we, we, we talked about this a lot. You know, each year a different challenge comes, but that's the job. And you don't know what, what it's going to be, but to think that you're just going to have a normal offseason that's cool, you know, calm and easy waters, that's just not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to happen at Ohio State. Um, and so, you know, that's just part of the job is adapting and trying not to, you know, overthink it all and or, or caught off guard is, you know, you try to do the best you can do, you know, plan ahead and have a contingency plans in place and do what's right. But at the same time, you know, you have to adapt to what you got. And, um, and I think, you know, we've done that. I think we've been aggressive, but I also think we've done what's right. But again, I, I just go back to this whole off season to me is about the guys who decided to come back. That to me was really important for a lot of reasons. It, it talks about our culture. It talks about our, our team, but I think it, it, it's important to have guys who not only are talented, uh, but, but have played a lot of football before. And, you know, I thought we got a little bit more veteran last year with Tommy coming back, Cade coming back, but now to have all these guys coming back as seniors is significant. And then we added and filled some holes, made some changes with the staff. Um, so it's exciting, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just a bunch of individuals. Now we got to come together as a team uh, because ultimately the best team is going to win the championship next year. WBNS. Going off the crazy offseason and, and the running back change, how much does it matter to this team and to the to the players, the destination of where Tony Hofford went? And, and how did you handle that? Obviously losing a coach, but losing it to your rival. No, I mean, our, our guys are, you know, we, we say that the term all the time, you know, win the moment. It's like, you know, you just got to focus on right now. Now That doesn't matter. You know, that, that game's going to come and and there'll be a team over there and we got to win the game. Um, what matters is, you know, our guys. And, um, you know, these guys are excited to see who the next coach is going to be. But, they're, but they've been great. They've been positive and And, um, you know, and I, like I said, they're going to be a part of it. I wanted to just because, like you said, you know, in March, you know, we're, we're, we're two practices in at spring break. There's a change. I felt it was important for them to have some feedback on this and bring them a part of it. And I think they appreciated that. When you look at this running back room, you said it's, it's the best in the country. It also is one of the most veteran when you look at Trey and Quinshawn and even Dallin. How much does that help you in this moment to know those guys, they're not new, they're not looking for as much guidance as, as some younger running backs? Would. Yeah, I think, it, I think it helps. I think, you know, for the younger guys, it probably hits a little harder just because, you know, they are younger. As you get older, you get a little bit more callous, you get a little bit more independent. Um, but you still have relationships, you know, and, and um, you know, they're understanding that's part of the profession. But – uh, but, but they, they've been good. And, and I think they, you know, Trey, you know, said it the best is that, you know, you rely on each other, you know, and then the brotherhood is strong here. And that's something we preach a lot is, you know, the, the relationships with each other, the love for each other. And ultimately that's, you know, what, you know, the power of the unit is all about. And so those guys in that room, they're strong and they're going to rely on each other. Ryan, how much do you need the second group of defensive tackles to step up this spring? Yeah. That Tyler McIntyre kind of set through right there, yeah. where they're going to be. It's it's that's one of the the, uh, the focuses I would say. Just you know, spotlights right there to figure out who those guys are that are going to step up. You know, there's a handful of guys in there that either came in last summer, like Jason Moore or, or uh, Will Smith didn't have a, a spring. Caden McDonald. Um, you know, Hero Canoe's now been here for a little while. I mean, there's, there's a handful of guys in there that now they this is this is their spring to step up. It's a very very important spring to build depth in that area, like you mentioned. Do you think that that Jason and Caden showed in year one the capabilities of taking that step into the spring, and, and what do you need to see from those two in particular that lets you know that they're ready for you know a role of, in a big game in November? Right. Or uh, you know, the talent is there. Um, that's for sure. You, know, you certainly you bring guys in at times, and and you say, well, maybe maybe that's not that's not the right fit, and and maybe they're not talented enough. That's not the case. They're definitely talented enough. Um, you know, do they build the skill that they need and the discipline to to get there? That's that's up to them. And so we'll know because you know we have a good offensive line, and they're going to challenge each other every day, and they're going to have great opportunity this spring. So um, we'll get a good feel for that. They're going to have a lot of opportunity. They got to show up and produce. That's just the bottom line. And. I think that's part of maturing as a player. You practice every day and it kind of, you know, you check the box. Okay, I got through that practice, but eventually you got to start making plays. Like you said, in a game, you got to start doing your job. You got to grade out a champion. You got to make TFLs. You got to do your job at a high level and be accountable to your, the guy next to you. So um, it's just more and more of an emphasis on that. You're not just out there practicing, you're out there to win a job. So we'll, we'll evaluate it, we'll grade it, 
And then again, by the, by the end of the spring, hopefully we identified some really good depth there, the guys that we can count on to go in a game because we're going to need it. It's a long season, as, as we know, and especially next year it was uh, going to be a new challenge for us. But, you know, we're going to have to play five deep, maybe, you know, maybe six deep throughout the year. That's just the reality. So uh, we need those guys. And so it is a huge, big spring for them. Yeah, you and Chip are so aligned. You're friends. You think alike. He seems like the perfect hire. And yet, Bill O'Brien was your first choice. Can you just talk? Was that a timing issue? What? How did that play out? Because, I mean, Chip seems perfect, and yet it was Bill. You know, the way that I, I did it, and it's kind of the same way that we're doing it with the running backs, is like right out of the gate, I tried to identify an A-list. Guys that I felt like, all right, if, if we can hire guys, and you know bill and chip were both on that list and i felt like if we could get one of those then we were in really good shape um and then there was a b list and then you know there was a kind of a c list and i felt like if we got to the c list i was probably just gonna go back to calm place i wasn't gonna force it at that point um but um it, it was more of a timing issue the first time around with, with chip um and so you know um, bill became available made that move and felt like the timing was right on that and then, um, you know, that changed and and then went right back to, to Chip. And, and the timing, even just a few weeks when you're de dealing with all of that comes into play. And, you know, I think for for Chip as well, you know, there was a lot on his mind, you know, and so he had to kind of sort through all that. And um, and then by the time, you know, Bill had left, um, you know, I think he was in a different place um, based on a lot of things. So um, it wasn't like I ranked them in that order. I kind of put them in. Hey, this is the A-list right here. If we can get one of those, man, we're where we need to be. And I'm, and I'm kind of doing the same thing with the running backs right now. Uh, and Chip, you know, he's kind of known or has been known as this offensive mastermind. And sometimes maybe those guys get short shrifted on how tough they are. Does he? Bring, how much toughness does he bring to this? You know, put your hand in the dirt and go. Because I think there can be a perception of, you know, they just like to kind of, you know, have fun on offense and, and guru it. Yeah, I think. You know, part of it is is how you run the football, um, and he's done that uh, historically year in and year out. I mean, he knows how to run the football. He has a heavy hand in the run game, um, how the offensive line blocks, how the running backs run. Um, if you sit in here like I did the other day in a unit meeting and he goes through a few of the runs, you'll see right out, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to see not only how talented he is, but what he demands in terms of toughness and physicality. Um, and I think, you know, the proof is the fact that he's been able to run the ball wherever he's been. Um, and so I think that's the way he is. That's the way he's always been. Dan Hope, Love Warriors. Ryan, where do you feel like you're at at the tight end position right now? And how many guys feel like you have ready to play there right now? Uh, you know, I think G. Scott's had a really good offseason. Um, I think Jelani, Will, Bennett. Those guys are going to have to really step up the next couple of weeks to figure out, you know, who's who's going to be able to play. Jay, G has played in games. I think he's had a really good offseason. I think he's going to have a really good spring. I think he's right where he needs to be. He still has to go do it. But um, but Cade took up a lot of a lot of reps. He ate up a lot of a lot of play. And so we, we need those guys, all of them. Um, but um, I'm, I'm excited about G's play so far. Again, not much to go off of, but. I think he's had the right offseason. He's got the right approach. His leadership and just demeanor has been excellent. Attitude's been off the charts. Uh, I think he's poised to have a really good year. Um, he has to go do it. But that, the, the rest of those guys, now they got to step up. we got to figure out what we can do there. And so we have been spending a little bit of time in 12 personnel to see, get those guys out there, get some reps. We'll start grading them here soon. Um, we'll find out. But um, but we got enough talent in the room. You know, it's, it's not like, again, not like what well, we look in the room and say, there's not enough guys. We got to go find somebody in the portal. That's not the case. I think we got to go develop them, but probably no more here again in a couple of weeks. And at wide receiver, what kind of growth have you seen from Carnell and Brandon in their second spring? And how is Jeremiah come along so far? Yeah, Brandon came in in the summer. So, you know, it's just, a, you know, you're, you're, you're a few months behind. Now he's, this is his first spring. He's going through it. I think you're seeing a different player. His body's changed completely from where it was last summer. Um, when, when he's, you know, in the right shape, he's, he's really talented. He's got great, quick, uh, short area quickness. He's got, um, uh, just a competitive fire in him. Um, you know, he was really good in winter workouts, a couple of things. He got called down on the mat one, just fierce competitor, football player, tough. Uh, the guy you want on your team, that's Brandon Ennis. And so now it's time for him to go play here this spring, but it's, he's been, he's had a great off season. Carnell is really, I, you know, had a really good off season as well. I think the sky's the limit for Carnell. 
Uh, he's extremely talented. Uh, he's been here now a year. So he went through the spring, went through a season. Now this is his second spring. So this is not new to him. Um, you know, based on what we saw coming off of last year, where he's at right now, he's right on pace with some of those other guys. So, um, but, but, you know, some other guys have stepped up as well. You know, you're seeing like, you know, Bryson Rogers step up. We need uh, Jaden Ballard to step up in a big way. He's got to be a contributor now going into the season for us. Um, certainly Jeremiah has flashed. Um, and so, you know, it, it's been good to see some of those younger guys get out there, but we're going to have to build depth in that room. Um, you know, Mecca's the leader in there and he's, he's obviously done a great job and um, he's healthy again, which is great. So, uh, it's going to be a good group, but we need to continue to push that depth, kind of like we talked about with the defensive tackles. Nathan Barrett, Cleveland.com. In general, how do you think of the, I guess, the, the factors of stability and um, tenure on the staff? Mm -hmm. Is that always a good thing to have that longevity? Is there a point for people when it gets stale? And, and do you hope that that resolve itself on its own just through natural attrition or is that something you have to be conscious of as you're making decisions you're yeah i think it's a great question it's something that i think about now going into you know this year um for me every year as a head coach you learn more and more and and you ask that question a lot you know when you know is the continuity or do you need to make changes in cer certain areas um and the best you can do is evaluate it year in and year out and figure out what's right and um you know you don't want to do a complete overhaul either you know, especially when when you get to be a player or two or drive away from where you need to be. Um, you know, if if things are just completely off, then, yeah, you got to do, you know, some major overhauls. But, um, you know, just moving that compass a little bit sometimes can get it right. And I think that's the art of being a coach and trying to identify what those things are. But, um, you know, sometimes it is good to make those changes. Sometimes it is good to have a little bit of a change of scenery, you know, for folks. But um, it all depends on who that person is and the situation. When a guy's been here for nine years and leaves from Michigan, how does that not feel like a betrayal in this building? I know fans kind of feel that way. Do, do you feel that way? Well, um, you know, everybody has to make decisions, you know, for the, for them and for their family. And, and so, you know, we try not to focus on that. You know, we know that, you know, we're going to play the schedule we play and, and um, you know, that game's going to come and, and, you know, there'll be a team on the other side with a bunch of coaches and we'll go from there. So, um, you know, we're not going to try to focus too much on that, but, um, but you know, more about our team and, and that's what it's going to come down to. But like you said, you know, people have choices to make in their life and, and they go and they have their careers. So, um, you know, and, and I think for us, it's finding the right mix of guys, um, the right mix with the staff, the right, right mix of guys on the team. And, you know, you just push forward from there, um, knowing that there's going to be twists and turns along the way. Any chance you want to tell us who that third A-list <laughs> no. um, Jack Sawyer, you've talked a lot about the guys coming back. He seems to be kind of the ringleader of that group, or at least was uh, last year. And then the way he finished the season, yep. the leadership plus the, the right. kind of coming together, how, how much can he make an impact next year, both on and off the field? Yeah, he broke down the team today after practice. I think, like you said, uh, in the way he played in that bowl game, he had some demeanor to him. I thought he played his best football at the end of the season. But more importantly, it was saying, I'm coming back, got to finish business. Let's boy, let's go, boys. Let's rally around this thing. To me, that was that was a sign of great leadership. That's something I won't forget. And, you know, that'll that'll that is a chance. Those kind of things have a chance to leave legacy behind. And being an Ohio guy, being from Pickerington, and you know, he was one of the first guys to jump in early on. And he helped recruit this class. And so he's a leader. And um, you know, he's only getting better every year. And he's got to be the tip of the spear for our defense. Uh, uh, Andy Baxter, Letterman Row. Right, you talked about Kenyatta Jackson last offseason as an NFL guy, someone that has a lot of prospects up and down season last year. He said that you helped him through that and kind of get over that, home, that part of last year. What have you seen from his progress and kind of working through that? Um, you know, Kenyatta has so much, so much talent. And it was great to see he and Paris, uh, his freshman year, kind of you know, work with each other. They would come after practice. They'd sit on the bench. They'd talk about the things that they didn't practice against each other. And I think you learn from that. But it's the consistency. Um, you know, we believe in Kenyatta. And when Kenyatta's believing in himself and he's positive, boy, he can be one of the best players on that field. Um, and so he, he's growing every single year and, and building more and more confidence by doing it on the field. And I think the guys in the room are helping him. Um, but it's like anything else, when, when you're trying to get to places that are hard, when you're trying to climb that mountain to be the best in the world at what you do, like you said, an NFL player, 
you need the guys around you. And I think there's guys in that room. I think there's, you know, coaches in the strength, strength and conditioning area, the weight room, um, you know, being the head coach, you know, it, it takes, a, it takes a village. And so maybe some things that, you know, you're not really innate at or good at, uh, you can learn from somebody else. And I think Kenyatta's continually, you know, uh, learned to open up and, and garner things from different people within the building to, to go reach his goals because he can be as good as he wants to be. Um, and so the challenge I know Coach Jay has put out for him is that, that consistency and uh, and believing in himself. And if, you know, one bad play doesn't make, make it a bad practice and one bad practice doesn't make you a bad player, you're going to have good plays and bad plays. It's like riding a bike when you do something for the first time. You're going you're gonna to fall off the bike. you got to get back on that bike and learn. And how quickly you get on that bike and drive is going to separate, you know, how long it's going to take you uh, from the next guy to go be great. But he has all the talent in the world, and he's working hard on that discipline and skill. Ryan, uh, you guys don't have a person on, on your assistant staff who's like has the title of special teams coordinator right. this year, first time in your tenure. Who who's is there a primary point person for that? Yeah. So um, what we've done there, you know, Macarary and uh, James are going to work on um, punt uh, and kickoff. And then Keenan Bailey and, and Brian Hartline will do punt return and kickoff return. Uh, I'm going to be very much involved with that. And then Rob Keys is one of our analysts and he's allowed to coach the coaches. And so he can really do a lot of the legwork in terms of off the field stuff, breaking down the film, uh, helping get things organized for us as we get into the meetings. But um, if you've sat in one of our punt meetings, Matt Guerrero is running that entire meeting. Uh, we get into punt return. Keenan will be up there. He'll be he'll be up there with a little bit of help from from Brian Hartline. But I'm going to be right there for every meeting and being a part of it. Um, but Rob is the, kind of the guy behind the scenes who's going to organize everything for the coaches. Because it's different than what you've done in the past. What ultimately led you to want to do that? Why is it just you have resources committed to other position groups? Did you like the structure for special teams at INF? Yeah, quite honestly. Um, I made a bunch of calls to a bunch of coaches, um, and one in particular that um, hit with me was when I talked to Coach Tressel, and he shared with me that, you know, he did this when he was here. He he assigned one of the, the special teams to each of the coaches, and it got great buy-in from the players because, you know, as a player, you want to really impress your position coach. You want to impress your coordinator. You want to impress the head coach. You know, sometimes the special teams coordinator can be a little bit low down the line, but when your position coach is up there, and he's coaching special teams and being the head coach, being a very much a part of it with them, uh, it, 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 it you know provided a lot of buy-in from the players. And I, it really you know made sense to me. And so we're doing it a little bit different than that. But that that kind of resonated with me, and I thought that was the right. Uh, Tim May, Tim May show and Letterman Rowe. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, a bunch of questions, but I'll just ask a couple. Uh, when you walked into that running backs room meeting for the first time, did you – prepare like I'm going to wow with something <laughs> you understand what I'm saying I mean did you because you didn't want them to think oh, well this is just a substitute teacher <laughs> no I mean, no that's uh I'm pretty sure they didn't think that um <laughs> no um you know being a part of the offense I think that you know they, they like to see it from the quarterback's eyes and just you know why we call things how we call things learning things conceptually and um so no it's been good I think I think they're they're enjoying. You have to ask them, but I think they enjoy a different point of view, different perspective. And it, uh, the uh, microphone, the uh, the speakers in the helmets and stuff. Yeah. You played quarterback. Do you like the idea that y'all will be huddling a lot more? I mean, just from a from a quarterback standpoint, what does that do for the quarterback in terms of, you know, yeah, grabbing everybody's attention in the huddle? I don't know if y'all will muddle huddle or what you'll sure. do. Yeah, all the, all the above. But I think. The positives of the huddle, like you said, is the quarterback can look guys in the eye. There's a little bit of that. You know, you break in the huddle, you run a line of scrimmage together. There's a little bit of that feel to it. Um, you know, I always like to know huddle because I think the pace of game, it was good for the game of college football. It just, you know, things were moving quickly. It was fun to watch. It was exciting. There was a lot, the ball was moving all over the place. But, um, you know, the whole, you know, the signal stealing and all those types of things have made it hard to do that. And so, you know, this allows us an opportunity to be more creative in those areas. Um, we'll still continue to have a bunch of variety with it to make sure that we can do it. Um, but it is different now because you're going to see more teams huddle. And then with uh, the clock moving after a first down, as we talked about last year, I think the combination of those two, um, because it's going to be a lot easier to huddle now with the, with the earpiece. So I, I think, again, you're just going to see a lot more, a lot less plays. Um, in our room over here, we have a breakdown of, you know, 
how many third down calls we have every game, how many red zone calls. And I think the first year in 17, we were like at 83 to 85 per game. Uh, I think after this year, we're close to 65. So we're almost down, I think, 20 plays since 17. Uh, and that's significant. It's just a different game. That's, that's you know, two or three, four drives. Um, so it just is what it is. got to adapt with it. But but I think those are the changes you're going to see. And really quickly, uh, there was a little video came out yesterday <laughs> or a couple of days ago, but Jack Sawyer's lobbying uh, uh, Chip Kelly, find him a place on offense, get him a touchdown, things like that. Caden Curry got into the game with you guys last year. Is the spring when you kind of look at those kind of things and, for example, uh, specifically Jack Sawyer, what would he bring? Because he, he told Chip to ask you about him. Yeah, he, uh, he's but, been asking for a long time. Yeah. So maybe you can get Chip to bite on it. I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah, but you haven't bitten yet. But, well, he, but he played quarterback in high school, so he, he's got some talent. But, yeah, I mean um, – yeah, yeah. Usually, it's usually more the preseason. You know, sometimes maybe in the spring we can, but you know, to me, the spring is more about you know improving the individual players, you know, toolbox and skill set, and allowing them to really focus on that. But yeah, I think when you get into goal line sets, short yardage sets, you gotta have to have the right guy, especially at fullback. That's the one in particular that you gotta make sure you have the right guy, especially when you don't typically recruit a fullback. Uh, so that's why you've seen us use Caden Curry, even Caden McDonald in, in the in the bowl game to do some of that stuff, but. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if you can talk talk Chip into doing something down there. Yeah, obviously the Alford thing caught you off guard, but you have a chance to really completely remake your offensive coaching staff really over the last couple of years. Brian's been here a while, but even he's a young coach. Um, how good do you feel about the potential of this coaching staff with Chip, with a running backs coach you feel confident about? Um because I know the last couple of years, you've probably had to do more than you wanted to with a very young staff. How good do you feel about it? Yeah, I think it has the potential to be the best offensive staff in the country, and that's um, what our goal should be. Um, again, you know, we're at Ohio State, so you know we want to have the best offensive line room, the best running backs room, the best DB room. We also want to have the best staff. And, you know, I think if we make the right hire here, we could do that. And um, like I said, you know, I'm going to step back away from the offense, but at the same time, I'm still going to be around too. So I think it's – it's exciting to you know still be a part of all of that, uh, but watching you know Chip run it is going to be great. Um, but yeah, I think when you look at the guys and the potential and the talent, and the mixture of experience and um, energy we have in the room, um, to me, you know, when I look across the country at everybody else's staff, I feel like this has a chance to be the best one. So we want to make sure we hire the right guy because I think it's a special opportunity. And at the center position, you were complimentary of Carson last time we talked. Um, you know, he had his struggles last year. You brought in Seth. Kind of where do you see that position right now? Still early. Um, again, I could probably tell you more as we um, as we head into, you know, probably next week. But, um, you know, Seth's snaps have been great. You know, I know that was a little bit of a concern. I think that had a lot to do with maybe the cadence or whatever. But so far, he's been he's been doing great. Um, you know, Carson, for the most part, I don't think there was one issue with the snaps today. So that's, that's, that's critical. Um, and then, you know. Now they got to, they both have experience. So that's great. And then trying to figure out who the best five is will be important. Uh, but we'll evaluate it once we get on. You don't know about offensive linemen until the pads are on. You just don't. Um, today was a padded practice, but it was pretty, it was on and off for a reason. And then uh, as we get, you know, some inside drill going, a few other things, we'll get a better idea. But they both have had good off seasons and good approaches. Well, we just, uh, oh boy. No, I guess. Um, I guess we're recruiting. A punter. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where I'm at in all this. Um, yeah, right right now, uh, we do have a couple of punters on, on the team. We are looking at some other punters as well. It's the most political answer in the history of mankind right there. <laughs> Ryan, do you know uh, who's going to throw tomorrow at Pro Day? Yeah, I think the plan is for Will to throw and for Devin to throw both uh, and be there for those guys because we do have um, several guys who are going to be running routes. Yep. Folks, thank you very much. All right, guys. Yep. 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 And uh, James are handling the, the those teams. The punter, yeah. Are they also coaching the specialists, or is there someone else that works with the specialists? Uh, yeah. So in in particular to to their position, yeah. So like you know, Matt will be dealing with the punters, and and then I'll I'll be involved with those guys as well, yeah, the kickers and all that. Yep. Yep.